So uh, again, my name is PJ. I'm a first year master's student at the Woodrow Wilson School. And I'm just really, really happy to see everyone here and to welcome you guys. Thank you for coming all the way to New Jersey. <laughs> and um, this, this event came out of a conversation between a bunch of master's students at, uh, in the policy program here. We were just wondering amongst ourselves, what should we as you know, aspiring policymakers know about same-sex marriage? We know what we read in the New York Times. We know what we hear on TV. But what should we know? And that's why I'm really excited to welcome people who can speak to that from the political and advocacy world, from the legal world, from the community organizing and faith-based world. Uh, so without further ado, let me just welcome Sean Eldridge, who's the political director of Freedom to Marry. Uh, this is from right to left, uh, skipping Dr. Hardock. So first, <laughs> <laughs> they always do. <laughs> in, the, in the suit is uh, Sean Eldridge, the political director of Freedom to Marry, which is the campaign to ma uh, win marriage nationwide. Freedom to Marry is pursuing its roadmap to victory, working to win marriage in more states, grow the national majority for marriage, and end federal marriage discrimination. As political director, Sean oversees communications, development, and federal initiatives. And as a spokesperson, he's made his case on Fox News, ABC, and in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Sean and his partner, Chris Hughes, who is incidentally the co-founder of Facebook, uh, are leading funders of marriage work across the country along with other progressive causes. Uh, before joining Freedom to Marry, Sean served as a youth organizer for Barack Obama's campaign. So next in line is uh, Suzanne Goldberg, who is a, a faculty member at Columbia Law School. She currently directs Columbia's Sexuality and Gender uh, Law Clinic and teaches civil procedure, lawyering, social change, and the movement for women's and gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender rights. Prior to joining the Columbia Law Faculty, she ran the Women's Rights Center at Rutgers Law School and serves as a senior staff attorney at Lambda Legal. Goldberg was the co-counsel in the US Supreme Court civil rights cases of Lawrence v. Texas and Romer v. Evans. She co-authored Strangers to the Law, Gay People on Trial. Uh, next up is Father Joseph Palacios, who is the founder of Catholics for Equality, uh, an organization founded in 2010 to support, educate, and mobilize Catholics in the advancement of freedom and equality at the federal, state, and local levels for lesbian, gay, and bisexual, bisexual and transgendered family, personers, and co community members. He's the author of The Catholic Social Imagination, Activism, and the Just Society in Mexico and in the United States. Pardon, that's all one title. <laughs> Uh, he's also the author of numerous articles on faith-based organizing, religion, and political culture, and community-based learning and research. And then finally, I'm really grateful uh, to Dr. Henrik Hartog, uh, who's, the, uh, who's the Class of 1921 Bicentennial Professor in the History of American Law and Liberty, and Director of the Program in American Studies at Princeton University. He's a leading expert in the institution of marriage, the author of Man and Wife in America, a History, a great mentor when I was helping plan this event, and also father of one of our classmates, Jacob Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so can you please take it away? Should I just do a quick introduction? You took away part of what I was working I was I thought I was supposed to introduce people, I'm but sorry. I'm happy to, <laughs> to lose it. Um, let me try and set the scene for the moment. In April 2004, shortly after the Goodrich decision by the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, the Organization of American Historians held their annual meeting in Boston. At that time, I was on a plenary panel on the historical meaning of the decision. And the gist of the panel was that this decision was consistent with and expressive of a historical evolution in marriage and marital rights back to the 18th and 19th century. Several of us voiced some uncertainty about the inevitability of that evolution. We are and were, after all, historians committed to the contingency of historical change. But the tenor of that meeting was one of optimistic change and of a new day dawn. Then a little more than two years later, I was again on a panel, in this case for the annual meeting of Equality Action. This time I was the only historian on the panel. The others were activists and lawyers and leaders of various LGBT organizations. By this point, two years after the second Bush election, the first he had won, of course, the tone was entirely different, anxious, defensive, fearful. A leading political strategist at the meeting characterized his work as entirely reactive and defensive, concerned only to hold ground, as all around the country states were considering constitutional amendments mandating that marriage could only mean a monogamous relationship between one man and one woman. I suspected at the time that he perhaps oversimplified and overstated. 
But on the other hand, I also knew that he had a good sense for the pulse of the time. So now, there are other meetings, but I won't go through all of them. So now, nearly five years further along, what will this panel reveal about the present moment? Many of the issues have not changed. Inequality and injustice survive in much of the country and in federal laws and regulations. Legislatures remain recalcitrant. The landscape of federalism and the presence of the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, DOMA, remain, although eyes are focused on Judge Turo's court in Massachusetts, where it is being challenged right now. What it means for policy, the subject of this panel, that change depends so often on judicial decisions and on novel interpretations of obscure and sometimes forgotten provisions in state constitutions, remains both unsettled and controversial. The power of various metaphors in court decisions, like the recurrent invocation of harms and wrongs of miscegenation laws as parallel to the harms and wrongs that same-sex couples have experienced, remain subject to challenge and exploration. And yet, political habits and the political culture are changing quite dramatically. By now, there is a thickening body of family law devoted to the situations of same-sex couples. That body both expresses and performs a normalization of practices and the forms of community life. There seems to be, according to opinion polls that I've read, a massive generational shift going on, even among religious communities predictably opposed to same-sex marriages. Younger people, who of course are growing into voters and political actors, <coughs> care less or not at all about sustaining the heterosexual monopoly about marriage. The military is undergoing its own tortuous but unqualified transition towards equality. There are reasons for optimism. But that's to state a conclusion prematurely and without the knowledge and experience that the members of this panel offer. So I don't need to introduce them. They'll, we'll move from Sean th through um, Suzanne, through Father Joseph, and then we'll open it up for conversation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I guess I'll start. Um, well, thank you very much to everyone who put the panel together. This is a really exciting moment to talk about marriage. Um, we're going to see in the next few months some, some real landmark moments in marriage, I hope. Um, so it's very timely to be here. It's an honor to sit next to someone like Professor Goldberg, who's been involved with gay rights and such huge landmark decisions. So it's great to be here. Um, I just, by way of introduction, want to say a couple words about where we are, um, how we got here in the last couple of years with five states with marriage, um, along with the District of Columbia, and then a little bit about what Freedom to Marry is doing and, and where we think we should be going and what we might expect in the next year or two. Um, so rewinding a little bit to 2009, it's sort of hard to believe that when President Obama uh, became the president, there were only two states at the beginning of 2009 that had marriage, um, Connecticut and Massachusetts. And throughout 2009, we went from two states to five states in the District of Columbia. We saw New Hampshire and Vermont um, win marriage through the state legislators. We saw uh, DC win through city council. And we saw Iowa win through the state Supreme Court. Um, that's a huge year. It's huge to go from, from two states to five states. Um, and it provided tremendous momentum to us now and, and continues to provide momentum. In the next year, in 2010, we saw equally important, a huge victory in terms of public opinion. So in 2010, um, this past summer, we saw for the first time two national polls showing majority support for marriage among all Americans, um, which is huge. <laughs> One was the CNN, the other was AP. These were real solid polls showing the progress that we'd made in such a short period of time. Um, also in 2010, we saw tremendous uh, victories in the court, which I think Professor Goldberg can talk, to, talk about in a bit more detail. But we saw um, victory in the Prop 8, uh, Prop 8 ruling in California, which was challenging the state level of discrimination through the federal court system. We won that case at the district level in a tremendous victory. And we also won at the district level a challenge to the so-called Defense of Marriage Act in Massachusetts, um, which was another tremendous victory. And that brings us to today, the beginning of 2011, where there's a lot more work to be done. So Freedom to Marry, um, as was said, is the, the national campaign to win marriage. And we believe that there's a pretty clear strategy of how this is going to happen. And we do work along what we call sort of three tracks of the roadmap to victory, how we're ultimately going to win marriage. At the end of the day, 
we believe this is going to take some sort of national resolution to win marriage nationwide for same-sex couples, either through the Supreme Court or through Congress. But to get there, we think we need a critical mass of public opinion and a critical mass of states. And we don't think we're quite there yet, but we're making good progress. So the three tracks of the roadmap to victory that we work on, which have to all be done at once, are win more states, grow majority support for marriage, and end federal marriage discrimination. And just very quickly on that last point, it's really important to understand when we talk about marriage and winning marriage for same-sex couples in the United States, there is state-level work and there is federal work. Now, of course, you get a marriage license from the state. Um, the state provides marriage licenses to couples, whether they're straight or gay, <coughs> unfortunately, in many cases, not to same-sex couples. And then the federal <coughs> government um, traditionally honors those marriages. So if you're a heterosexual couple, you get married um, in any state. As long as you follow those, that state's um, procedures, you fill out the right paperwork, you're the right age, you get married and it's valid in one state, the federal government then honors your marriage. Well, because of the so-called Defense of Marriage Act, which Congress passed in 1996, and which President Clinton signed into law, that's not the case for same-sex couples. The Defense of Marriage Act says that for the sake of federal law, and there are thousands of rights and protections related to marriage federally, that marriage is restricted to a man and a woman. Now, when that passed in 1996, there were no legally married same-sex couples in the United States. This was theoretical discrimination. Now, with five states in the District of Columbia, we have tens of thousands of legally married same-sex couples and more getting married every day. So what does that mean? That means that those tens of thousands of legally married couples are treated by our federal government today as strangers or, at best, as roommates. So for everything from Social Security, to immigration, the right to sponsor a partner for a visa or citizenship, to the entire tax code, legally married same-sex couples are denied all of the federal layer of protections and responsibilities of marriage. So back to that roadmap, win more states, grow majority support for marriage, and end federal marriage discrimination. Just a couple sentences about what we're doing on each. Freedom to Marry works on the ground with our state and local partners. Um, on everything from communications to field work to lobbying to public education to win the next round of states this year and next year and in the years to come. In terms of growing majority support for marriage, again, we're at this critical 52% point in terms of support among the general population. On Monday, Valentine's Day this year, we just launched a really exciting um, campaign called Why Marriage Matters, which is a $10 million three-year initiative to, to win over the next swath of Americans through advertisements on TV, radio, online, wherever we think it will be most effective. And we really believe that, that if we message to that next movable middle about why same-sex couples want to get married and why they need to have the right to get married, we can make tremendous victory, um, uh, sorry, we can make tremendous progress in public opinion. And finally, in terms of ending federal marriage discrimination, there's two ways that will happen. DOMA will either be knocked down by Congress or by the Supreme Court. We are now opening a DC presence to push Congress to do the right thing, to heed President Obama's call to overturn DOMA. Um, but of course, there is the, the litigation strategy, which we're not directly involved in, but we're trying to educate the public about what DOMA is and that federal layer of discrimination that I think most people don't understand and don't know about. So we have a lot of work to do just to help people understand the state and federal layer nature of marriage. So that's our work. That's our strategy. Just very briefly, what we might see in 2011, uh, what we're working on right now, and then in, in 2012. Um, this is a very busy month for, for my team and for me. I've sort of been doing the, the tour of the capitals. There are, there are three to four states that we think we can win this year, uh, which, is, which is a lot. Um, right now, we're working hard in Maryland, Rhode Island, and New York to win, we hope, as soon as in the next few months, um, through state legislators. Uh, we have supportive governors in all three of those states. Um, none, of, none of those victories are a given, but we feel optimistic and our teams are on the ground there doing everything we can to make that happen. Um, another state we could win this year, which Professor Goldberg could explain better than I could, is California through the legislation, uh, sorry, excuse me, through the ongoing litigation. Um, uh, we could win California through the Prop 8 case. No one knows exactly what the timing on that would be. And then looking ahead to 2012, um, we expect a few more states to be in play, uh, to be in play sorry, Maine, Oregon, and um, if we do win in Maryland, unfortunately, there's a good chance we'll have to defend that on the ballot next year. If we won in Rhode Island or New York this year, it would be more of a clean victory. Uh, it would unlikely be to go to the ballot. 
So it's a really exciting moment where we have an opportunity to go from five states um, and the District of Columbia to seven states, eight states in a really short period of time. And ultimately, with these, these federal litigation, uh, these federal cases going on, both to challenge DOMA, there are about four or five or six cases now challenging the Defense of Marriage Act, and then with the Prop 8 style litigation challenging that state level of discrimination, we feel a real sense of urgency because we think the best way to either get the Supreme Court or Congress to do the right thing is really grow those number of states and grow that public opinion. Um, and that's what we're working on. Thank you. I'm also really delighted to be here. And I want to thank the organizers and all of you for coming out. And one of the, the things that I very much believe, um, and I, I spend a lot of time talking with my law students uh, about, is that the nature of doing social justice work is very much about having conversations and changing conversations. And I think it it's, uh, was, uh, was wonderful to have our opening situated in, in a historical perspective, because one of the most salient things when we think about marriage is how the conversation about marriage, both generally speaking, but then specific to same-sex couples, has changed really quite dramatically over the past several decades. So what I want to do is spend my 10 minutes kind of giving you a very quick historical tour, although I will try to, you know, defy my usual tendency to talk too fast. Uh, but what I want to do is, is, is give you a sense of both legally where things were early in the early litigation campaigns to get you to have, have a sense of how things are where they are today, uh, talk a little bit about the current litigation, and then close out with some discussion about the kinds of arguments that are getting traction in court or try, where there are efforts to get these arguments traction in court. So. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this really wonderful quote from, from Gandhi, which he's talking about the arc of social movements, where he says, first said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, and then they fight you, and then you win. <laughs> now, not every social movement follows that arc. There's an argument that we don't want every social movement to follow that arc. But it is a very interesting way to, a, lens, a very interesting lens through which to think about the history of advocacy for marriage rights for same-sex couples. Because when the, very, the earliest cases uh, reported on marriage uh, came in the 1970s. And what's so interesting about those cases is that the nature of them was very much the same as it is today. A same-sex couple in this particular case, a gay male couple, went to court and said, we want to be married, right? And it was in a moment following on the black civil rights movement, in a moment of women's liberation, in a moment of sexual liberation, where the you know, deep uh, sort of uh, spreading through society was, was very much the idea that, that a, a, of a belief in individual autonomy, in opening up, breaking away from what had been traditional categories of living and ways of thinking. And so it seemed quite logical and natural, of course, that, that this uh, gay couple could go and get their marriage license, um, which they did not. And when the <clears throat> arguments were presented to the court, and again, their arguments were not so different from the arguments right now. I'll detail them in a moment. But the arguments were presented to the court. What does the court say? The court says, the dictionary says that marriage is between a man and a woman. Right? Therefore, your constitutional arguments about privacy and equality really um, are, are losers, in essence. And so I would put that in the Gandhi-esque framework somewhere in between ignoring you and laughing at you, because the dictionary, the Webster's Dictionary, wonderful as it is, is hardly a response to a serious constitutional argument, I think. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, but so, so bringing ourselves uh, really uh, significantly forward, I want to give you a bit of a picture of the different kinds of cases that have put us in the position where we are today, which Sean really nicely described. Uh, but what, I guess what I want to do even before that is to supplement your story about the relationship, uh, recognition of relationships of same-sex couples, because it's absolutely true, right? Five states and Washington, D.C., a same-sex couple can go to court or go wherever you go and go to the, the, in New York City, it's like a very depressing building where you have to go and get a marriage license if that's, uh, whatever. I mean, maybe it's not, I guess it's not depressing if you're going, but it is not, <laughs> it's not a pretty building, let's say, um, and get married. So there are five states and D.C., but that's really not all there is, right? There are 
one, two, or three states, depending on how you count them, that don't offer marriage licenses directly uh, to same-sex couples, but will recognize the marriage licenses obtained in other states. New York is one of those. You can go on your lunch break to Connecticut and get married and come back, and New York will recognize you as a married couple. Uh, Pennsylvania will not. Um, for example, Rhode Island and, and Maryland are those two other states that, that I was talking about in that count. But then there's something else. There are seven states that have what we think of as fairly comprehensive recognition of same-sex couples partnerships, meaning that, they, that, that those states recognize virtually all of the rights for those couples that they do for different sex married couples to tick them off, California, Nevada, New Jersey, Oregon, Washington, Illinois, and Hawaii. Illinois and Hawaii being the brand newest of, of this bunch. And then there are a couple of more states, Colorado and Maine, that have some version of recognition for same-sex couples. And when you add all of this up, uh, you get a, um, 90 million people and 30% of the country where same-sex couples can get some form of relationship recognition. And that matters so much in connection with what Sean was just saying, because that has changed the conversation. And it's changed the conversation both in terms of the advocacy in state houses and the advocacy on Capitol Hill about either repealing the Defense of Marriage Act that is federal, meaning nationwide, or the Defense, Defense of Marriage Acts that are in individual states. Um, it also matters for the litigation. Because when you go to court and you present the same equality and privacy arguments, which I'll describe more in a moment, uh, that were presented in the 1970s and the 80s, they might sound the same. You might be citing to the same, you are citing to the same parts of the Constitution. But the reception is different because the society in which those arguments are made understands them differently and has, as I often think of it, kind of different receptors for hearing the arguments, for, for integrating them, and for, for listening to the arguments on both sides. Uh, just to put this in a little bit more perspective, I think people often think that the US is relatively progressive on, uh, with respect to equality. Um, there are so bad at numbers. I think it's 11 or 13. I'll tick them off for you really quickly. Countries in the world where same-sex couples can go and get married. Uh, Argentina, all over the world. Argentina, Belgium, Canada, Iceland, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, South Africa, Spain, Sweden, and Mexico, where you can get married in Mexico City, but your relationship will be recognized anywhere, and your marital relationship will be recognized anywhere in the country. So from that standpoint, we're not really doing so well in the US, but thanks to, to, to groups like Sean's, we are uh, moving things along. I guess one other historical piece, and then I'll get to the law part and turn it over to the faith part. So I think this is very nicely complimentary. Uh, it's important uh, to, to realize that the, argue, the advocacy for marriage equality in, uh, um, among lesbians and gay men has not been uncontested. Right? While I think even in the early debates, no gay rights advocates ever said, look, gay people should be denied access to the things that, to this relationship status that same-sex couples have. There were and there still are arguments that marriage is not the answer to all equality, and that part of what gay people had and still have by virtue of being legal outsiders in many senses is an ability to form families in a way that, uh, in a way that is freed from the cookie cutters that the government supplies us. Right? So that there's a, there, there's a more diverse kind of family formation, and that one of the risks in advocating for marriage rights is that the push for broader family recognition, for legal recognition of the, the tremendous variety in, of, of the, in the ways our families function, um, gets lost right, when gay people move into marriage. Right? It's a very assimilationist story to advocate for marriage. On the other hand, and again, as I said, it's a very much an equality, and, and, and not an inequality story, and space equality story, um, that we can't really have an a society, I would argue, in which the government offers a relationship status to one set of people that it doesn't offer to other similarly situated people. And I probably have, what, like 60 seconds left? I didn't keep my time very carefully. But let me say, so, so that I want you to be aware of, as a, because it affects the way, the kinds of arguments we make about marriage. The legal arguments are pretty straightforward, like I said. There are mainly two sources. 
um, come from two different places in constitutions, either the US Constitution or for the state-based cases, the state constitutions. One is what is typically under a privacy clause, right? There is no part of the Constitution that protects your right to privacy explicitly. The US Constitution protects your right to due process, right? Fair treatment as it's been interpreted by the court. That is the source of protection for uh, the, the uh, ability, your, your ability to use, re your, your ability to use um, contraceptives without government interference, as well as a woman's ability to decide to terminate a pregnancy, right? That's the source of the protection that the Constitution gave through Roe versus Wade. Um, and likewise, that is the source of protection for the, what is called in the law the fundamental right to marry. Right? So that's one argument, right? That, this is a, that, that marriage is a fundamental right and whenever the government infringes a fundamental right, it has to have uh, what is called a compelling justification or what is in more accessible language, right? A really, really good reason before it can <laughs> restrict that right. So that's one. There's a fundamental right to marry and by excluding same-sex couples from that fundamental right, uh, the government has infringed that right and it lacks a compelling justification. The second argument, and, and I say second, but they're really offered you know, one, either one can go first in the briefs. Uh, this, the other argument is the equality argument, and that is in the equal protection guarantee, which is explicitly in the United States Constitution and in many state, con all state constitutions, I think, which is the equality argument, the idea that whenever the state draws a line, right, we call it a classification, but whenever the state draws a line and puts one group of people on one side and the other group of people on the other side, it has to have at least what is called a rational basis, or something more, a compelling justification for that line drawing. So what does that mean? That at the very least, the state has to have, the government has to have a legitimate reason for, for saying, to, for in this case, saying we draw a line in relationship recognition, same-sex couples are on one side and different-sex couples are on another side. And the argument there is, even under that very weak test in the law, the rational basis test, there is no, the government has no legitimate reason for treating same-sex and different-sex couples differently for this purpose. Um, I'm sure I'm out of time, so let me just say two more quick things, or one more quick thing. One kind, well, there, here's the three, here are the three kind of cases. We can talk about this more in the discussion. One kind of case that is, is active, that, that are, is being actively litigated, is the kind of case where same-sex couples go to court, state court, and say, we want the right to marry, right? And you are denying us this right to marry, you're violating our privacy and equality rights. A second type of case, which is the type Sean talked about, is the challenge to the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. We are married, and we are being discriminated against by the federal government because the government is not recognizing our marriage. Um, the third kind of case is the unique kind of case that's happening in California with the big rigmarole around Proposition 8. And I say it's, a, it's kind of a merger of the first two, but the idea there is <clears throat> essentially that the state of California, by giving gay people marriage and then taking it away uh, through Proposition 8, is denying those equality and privacy rights I was just talking about under the federal constitution. Uh, happy to talk more, but let me turn it over to the faith end okay, of the great. discussion. It's a great pleasure to be here at Princeton. Um, I'm so happy to be invited, and um, I really thank a former student of mine who, uh, actually my research assistant at Georgetown, uh, Hector, um, <laughs> Hector, Ever, I'm sorry, Ever, Ever Delgado, who uh, was my research assistant for a year. Are there any other Georgetown grads here? Okay, great, okay. Anyway, I am also a professor at Georgetown. Uh, I'm a sociologist, and um, so I have a, like a full-time teaching there, but full-time volunteer with this national organization. Um, I've entitled uh, my, my, my little talk here, The Catholics, the Key Movable Middle for Full Inclusion, uh, LGBT inclusion in the United States. And uh, before, before I get into some Catholic stuff, I just want to give an overview of how I look at the, the situation with religion in the United States. Now, I'm going to give you just a generalization <laughs> of what I think are the challenges for public policy and legal changes in our country because of the effect of religion on politics, the effect of religion on, on law. Um, 
like you, a historian, I've, I've often been at meetings where I'm the only person addressing culture. You know, so culture historically or culture through religion. And um, recently I was appointed to a task force at the State Department on uh, LGBT issues in Latin America. And I'm the only person in this working group of 20 people, most of them are lawyers and policy wonks. And, uh, you know, where is religion, you know, in this picture? It's in Latin America of all places. Um, and, and that's what I want to really bring here to the table, that culture matters with uh, legal change. And in the anthropology of law, you know, we know that you cannot have really good law affected unless there's cultural shift that goes along with the law so people accept the law at the end of the day. You know, so we're going through this period here historically of bringing that together. So I look, I analyze religion um, in the United States historically and presently with two streams of what might be called civil religion in, in the United States. I mean, most people have focused on civil religion from a kind of liberal tradition of Judeo-Christian ethos, you know, that culminated in the high point of the civil rights movement in the United States. But I look historically at this, and we've always had a conservative civil religion and a more progressive civil religion. And the, the two streams of thought in terms of the how religion gets implanted in civil society and then moves into uh, politics and law are, are generally organized, at least in terms of the conservative side, biblically based orientation. So fundamentalism is part of that kind of orientation. You know, it's in the Bible, we don't argue about it. You know? um, there are people like Jim Wallace, who's a head of Sojourners, who is a wonderful guy and kind of guy in terms of social justice issues, but he's stuck on the gay issues because it's in the Bible. You know, it was you know condemned. You know, and he doesn't go to the sources. And a lot of the fundamentalist sorts don't have the um, biblical tools uh, like hermeneutics to to use in interpreting the Bible. Um, another part is American exceptionalism. Uh, very conservative religions believe that God has ordained the United States to be an exceptional country. And we are doing God's will in the world. You know, so all the kind of stuff that comes out of that kind of orientation, Manifest Destiny in, in particular, or going to save Iraq, you know, it's, it's, this is the kind of stuff that goes into this sense of American exceptionalism. The other part of this is nuclear family. There is this fundamental sense, there's the man, the woman, and the kids. You know, and, and most people who study the family know that this is very recent. It's more a modern invention, you know, that this nuclear family comes out of the industrial age. Um, I mean, the Bible, if you go back to that, I mean, there's no nuclear family in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures. The multiple wives, etc. Jesus comes out of a family that his unwed mother and, um, and, and, you know, the father, you know, took him in, but, you know, this was a very interesting kind of situation. Um, so the, the, this, <laughs> and furthermore, in the Catholic tradition, in the Orthodox tradition, there has always been this high like level of you know celibacy has is a higher calling. You know, so there these are contradictions to you know the way uh, the fundamentalists actually look at what is the family. And Jesus says, "Leave your family behind. Follow me." You know. That's, it's really strong. He doesn't say stay with your family and nurture your family. He, he doesn't. He says, get them, you know, the days are numbered. You've got to get out of there. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, and, and lastly, there, there's a general otherworldly orientation. You know, um, one of my colleagues at Berkeley once asked me, okay, why, what do Catholics think about heaven? And I said, um, you know, most of the people I know out of Vatican II period, we think of, you know, heaven is not, it's like here on earth, you know, it's uh, like already but not yet. But the, the, this conservative orientation really is looking for heaven. That there is an end days, and we have to, we're going to be accountable, and that you better, you know, get ready, because, you know, the second coming is coming, and you're going to be lifted up and, you know, brought in through the rapture and, you know, brought through the pearly gates. And that's a strong, strong conviction. And so particularly conservatives who are looking for gays to convert to heterosexualism, you know, they're, they're looking at your salvation. And it's fundamental to the way they orient themselves to the world. Okay, and on the other hand, the progressive side is instead of, there's the Bible, but, you know, if you think of the liberal Christians in particular, 
um, Protestant liberals, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, um, liberal Catholics, liberal Methodists, um, liberal Jews for that matter, liberal Muslims for that matter. They look at the world from an inductive approach where we look at justice in the actual experience of people versus a deductive approach to justice, which is like the, God has already ordained this picture, and now we have to fit in. The, the liberal perspective, and I, it's, I think it, out of the liberal tradition where we, empiricism comes into the world as a, a way to look at the world, and it's challenged to theology and, and its um, uh, abstractions, that this, this liberal world is really to look at justice from the lived experience of people. I mean, the starting point is that like people who do not feel included. So social justice is where you feel excluded. And you know, especially in my church, the Catholic Church, that is fundamental to the whole concept of, of uh, liberation theology, the concept of uh, doing uh, for the marginalized, um, and uh, which I'll get into in a moment. So th those are these are fundamental orientations. And lastly, and I have to say this, I, I hadn't thought about it until I got, actually got here, um, uh, is Professor Robert George in the audience? Oh, I hoped I wanted to like debate him. Anyway, uh, anyway, he's he's like my key enemy. Okay, um, <laughs> why why is Robert George my key enemy? Because he, as a Catholic thinker, has actually organized this whole perspective for the conservative side, uh, for Catholic natural law thinking to link up with fundamental Bible uh, 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 interpretation, and so there's this new fusion between a new kind of Catholic fundamentalism through natural law and, and the biblical fundamentalism of the, of the Protestants. And so this is also want to make you aware that that's a very strong force that's behind the organization, the National Organization of Marriage, which you know, unites these two, those two streams of religion, and other organizations, the Family Research Council, you know, it, 30 years ago, you, you would have never imagined a Catholic in those rooms with those people. They thought we were heathens, you know, you know, papists, they, you know, we're going to hell in a handbasket. But now they're like bosom buddies working together to counter the social justice issues for women and for gays in our country. Okay, so um, what, what, I, what I want to do for the rest of my talk, and I'm going to try to get run through this really quickly, um, is that... What we're trying to do in the organization Catholics for Equality is forge two set of principles, American values and Catholic values. Um, this is the 50th anniversary year for John Kennedy's presidency. And Kennedy was the kind of, for me, the emblematic person that was able to bring American and Catholic together and usher in a new age of inclusion for Catholics. When I was a kid, it tells my age, you know, when I wore my little Catholic school uniform to school, we just thought we were like excluded and, you know, we thought we were pariahs to the public school kids. And there was a real division in American life between Catholics and the rest of the people. And there were, there were glass ceilings in many places for Catholics. And when Kennedy came in as president, he ushered in an age where that you could be fully American and fully Catholic. And this is what we're trying to continue with this kind of philosophy. American means to believe in freedom, equality, inclusion, and opportunity. And to be Catholic is to, first of all, and foremost, to love, and to look at family as a sense of inclusion, um, forgiveness, compassion, and solidarity, social solidarity, which is a very strong component of Catholic social justice teaching. Um, on the bottom here are some statistics um, that are very telling. Um, Catholics, um, up in, by 19, uh, excuse me, 2010, last year, 62% of Catholics think that gay and lesbian relations are morally acceptable. Now, this is a very big statistic. It may not mean marriage or yet, but they're moving along. It means that, that they don't question. It's not sinful to be gay or to act out as gay. Okay, whereas our Protestant brethren, um, uh, only 42% believe that in general, Protestants in general, because I, you know, I, you can't, want, all Protestants are not all alike, as I just explained, liberal and, and conservative, but as a, as a, a big, and 20 Catholics represent 25% of the U.S. population. So this is a huge group that is really changing culture. Um, presently, 69% of Catholics favor the legalization of the basic rights for gays. So, 
and 48% uh, of Catholics accept full marriage equality around the country. Uh, only 46% opposed. But what's interesting is looking at this, um, uh, where's the chart? There was another, I must have, oh, foo, I left it out. <laughs> this is the problem. Okay. Anyway, it's, 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 a, it's the statistics shift really radically with age. So that um, 50 to 64 year olds um, are in favor of opposing. Only those 65 and older are really, really opposed. And of course, when you're doing voting calculations, the old people vote. So, you know, but that's why we have to get in strategies for the young people to get out to vote. Because if they don't get out to vote, particularly in key states where there's a movable middle of Catholics, and I want to just say this, very, um, it's, it's our belief, looking back at the statistics in California, Prop 8, the situation in Maine, those two, those, those two key states where we were, uh, marriage rights were removed, it was 3 to 5% of Catholics who could have been moved. And if there had been a campaign to shift those Catholic, the Catholic movable middle, they would have, might, we might have won. But there wasn't a single strategist focusing on Catholics in those states. The Human Rights Campaign, which I'm a Board of Governor, didn't do anything. Freedom to Marry didn't do anything. Um, the GLAD didn't do anything. The Task Force didn't do anything. They all had Protestant groups, but they, don't, they didn't deal with the Catholics, so that's why we got off the ground, because if we really want to win the battle, it's the, the movable middle. Liberal Protestants have already made up their mind. I mean, you can't, Unitarians, they're, they're with us. <laughs> <laughs> You, UCC, United Church of Christ, with us. The, 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 the Episcopalians split, you know, but they're with us mostly, okay. And, and you've got the, the denominations are already lined up. It's the only group that isn't lined up are the Catholics. We, we go straddle both sides, and, and this is why the Catholics are a key factor for the movable middle for future campaigns. Um, the other factor is Latino Catholics. This is a very interesting thing. Uh, a recent poll by the Public Religion Research Institute at Washington did a, um, a major poll for uh, the post Prop 8 situation. They found that 57% of Latino Catholics are for, gay, for full rights for gay marriage, more than the mainstream Catholics. And this is counterintuitive to a lot of, especially bishops that I've talked to. They believe, well, you know, Latino Catholics are the most traditional, conservative, and all that. In fact, they're not. And just look at Argentina, and look at Spain, look at Portugal, and look at Mexico. Okay, and I did an op-ed piece for the Washington Post recently, and, and it asked, like, why does this happen? I said, it's very clear to me as a Latin Americanist that, um, yeah, Catholic, you know, they're, they're, they're Catholic countries, but they don't want to have their bishops tell them what to do in politics. There's a, there's a phrase in Spanish, no meta la politica. They have a long history of knowledge of Franco in the church, Pinochet in the church, you know, uh, the, the, the whatever dictators were in Argentina, and of course the situation in Mexico with um, collusion with the Catholic. So they, you know, they don't want the church to be meddling in politics. So they, 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 they and it's for, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Latino myself, I mean, we can live in contradictions. So we can be really Catholic, but then just disobey the church's laws. <laughs> You know, that's actually a Catholic value. <laughs> and I, I learned as a Jesuit, I learned as a Jesuit, you know, it's better to ask permission than, uh, better to seek forgiveness than to ask permission. <laughs> okay, I'm going to wrap this up because I'm tying up this, but I talked about uh, Catholic uh, young people, um, and I just want to show this slide here. Catholic young people, are very c complex also. Catholic young people are not for uh, uh, pro-choice. 66% believe that, uh, millennials believe that abortion's always wrong. Okay, so, but on the same time, on uh, gay lesbian relationships, only 35% think that gay relationships are morally wrong all the time, whereas 37, 28, uh, a good 65% um, believe that being gay like the other previous statistics is no problem. So there is a complexity to the issues for Catholic young people. Um, 
And I think that policymakers should, you know, should see that as a very interesting statistic that liberal Catholics are mixed. They're, they're, and what we're trying to do is um, look at LGBT issues. We're trying to frame the issue as a pro-life issue in a, a different kind of way. Pro-life means for the, the holistic growth of every child of God. Everyone has, uh, there's a Jesuit saying, cura personalis in, in Latin, but the care of the whole person. And so we're trying to project the sense that, that uh, that's a, that's a pro-life issue for Catholics. Now, some of you in the audience may not like this kind of phraseology, but if we want to win Catholics over, that's what we're trying to push toward. Like, pro-life means pro-gay, meaning pro your child, pro your family, pro the extended family, and in a sense, and also we're working with some people in mental health, that this will also help with problems of young gays who are committing suicide, young gays who get uh, involved with drugs and alcohol, uh, HIV status because of uh, risky sexual behaviors. All of those come from the lack of self-esteem, particularly among Catholic youth who feel excluded and try to pull together then a holistic approach to Catholic life. So I'm going to conclude with that. Thank you very much. I, suppose I will play the role of, uh, we've gone far enough that I don't think I'm going to say anything more, but just take comments, unless one of you want to speak to each other's comments at all. Well, I, one thing I would add, and then I, I would love to open yeah. questions, is I mean, I think we've painted a relatively rosy picture. That's, I was, that's of, what I would have said. Right, <laughs> which is when you when you do this work and you lose, sometimes you have to stay upbeat. So I think we're all good at that. But you know, I, I don't. One thing I didn't hit on is 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 one the extremely well funded opposition that we just heard a little bit about, and two the the states where we are having to fight to protect our victories. So it's important to know that in New Hampshire and in Iowa. There are multi-million dollar anti-gay campaigns being waged against us. And as much as we should be putting all of our energy into those next states that we would like to win, like the Maryland and the Rhode Island and the New York, we're forced to put our staff and our time and our money into defending those victories in places like New Hampshire and Iowa. And even though I think the, the LGBT movement is growing and getting, and getting better at this work, um, we, are, we are very small in comparison to, to the opposition that is out there in terms of money, in many cases in terms of political heft. So there's a lot, there's a lot of work to do. Um, and I think most of the people in this room would like, to, would like us to win on this issue in five years, not in 25 years. And if we want to do that, the next few years are going to be really critical um, for all of you to be involved, but, but also for, for us to be doing our work as well as we can. I can't resist. I actually want to say so much, but I'm going to just be very brief um, uh, so we can have more conversation. Uh, uh, I guess two, maybe two things. One is, um, and it, this grows out of something that you were just saying, which is part of the educational work and that, that has been done around the country that I think has been useful and I think more needs to be done is to distinguish between civil and religious marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, because much of the discussion and the public debate centers on concerns uh, deeply felt that religious institutions that do not, uh, whose doctrine does not approve of homosexuality or same-sex sexual relations um, will be forced to marry same-sex couples. And that, I find, is one of the most frustrating arguments in the public debate because it is simply not true, right? The, 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 the legal fights, the political fights, the public policy work is around civil marriage. It is around what the state does, not what religious institutions do. And I think it's important to remember in that connection that the way the state functions with respect to marriage is as a gatekeeper, right? The state is deciding who's in and who's out. The state has the monopoly over civil marriage. That's why we can make the constitutional arguments about the fundamental right to marry and equality, because the Constitution only governs what the government does, right? It doesn't govern how we treat each other. It governs how the government treats us as its constituents. Um, and the second point is, is on the question of, of, you know, is the change fast? Is the change slow? Is it happening, you know, is it going to take forever or not forever? And I, I imagine that some of you in this room don't want it to change in this direction at all. And I think that part of the beauty of having this conversation in an academic setting 
is that we can have those conversations and that we can have that debate. And I wouldn't want any of you to take anything that I have said here as an unwillingness to engage in the conversation about whether this is a good thing at all. But in terms of the why it is, where it is, and how it takes, I mean, really, Professor Hartog is the best person to, to speak to this. And I would just say, from my perspective, in terms of the legal arc, Right. Marriage has changed very slowly over a long period of time. And if you even just look at marriage with respect to the status of women in marriage, uh, as you probably know, right, there was a, you know, for a very long time, women, when they married, lost their legal identity, even though they may not have had such an independent one because they were through, you know, largely protected by their fathers, uh, but really literally lost their legal identity, could not enter into a contract, could not be paid independently for work that they did. And it is really only relatively recently that women have gained full independence, legal independence in marriage. Uh, so in that sense, and as we know also, it was only uh, in the 1960s that the U.S. Supreme Court declared that interracial marriage could not be prohibited by the states, and that relatively recent polling shows that some states would like to re, or some, some voters, many voters, would like to, to, to recriminalize uh, interracial marriage. So things change quickly and things change slowly, and I think that that is an important piece. And the last thing I'll say is why? Right, why does it change at this kind of interesting pace. I think a lot of it, in my mind, has to do uh, less with legal argument and more with intuition. And that is that um, I don't actually think there are good legal arguments for why the state should deny same-sex couples the right to marriage or why, why the state should exclude same-sex couples. But I do think there are intuitions that are deeply felt about what is good for society and what is not, and that those intuitions uh, don't only take their place in the public debate, but also take their place in the votes that legislators cast and in the way that judges look at the cases before them. And that part of the conversation that, that my colleagues here are working on through their, through their daily work is about how to unstick. I think of them, I've written an article about these sticky intuitions, and I think of part of the work is about unsticking the intuitions and destabilizing them so that we can have new kinds of conversations. I would like to add right to that because I think your point on the distinction between civil and religious marriage is, is so apropos. Um, in that Washington Post article that I wrote, I also uh, said that, um, why is it that in Argentina, Portugal, Spain, um, Mexico, that this has happened, gay marriage has happened? And one of the major reasons is in all those countries, the civil, excuse me, the religious ministry has no civil jurisdiction. There's a civil marriage first, you know, you know, por lo civil, and then you go get married por la iglesia uh, in a church, and they're two distinctive things. In our, we're one of the few countries in the world where there is the capacity for the religious ministry to be the civil, um, the civil authority. Um, Personally, I think the religious minister should have no civil authority for marriage. I wish we could cut that out, but it's not going to change because it's a big cultural thing. And most of my Protestant colleagues, I'll be frank, love to do the marriages. And as a, as a more cynical person, there's money to be made. There's lots of money to be made in doing marriages in churches. So um, that's my cynicism. Um, however, um, I think that, th so the decoupling of that is important, and I think that's why, especially for Latin American immigrants, there's a more, is an easier capacity to think this through, and, and other immigrants here to think that through, because in their countries, you, you, the religious minister doesn't do any marriages, okay? But we've conflated this in, in the U.S. for, you know, I don't know, I don't know historically. <laughs> Massachusetts. Okay, in the yeah. Century. So it's it's one of the we have separation of church form in the seventeenth yeah. century. <laughs> so you know, so here we have separation of church and state, but in fact we don't on this matter. Um, a, a couple, a, a male couple asked me to do their marriage recently, and I had the civil jurisdiction in the District of Columbia. I have a license to say you know that I can do this, and I said you know I really don't in principle want to do this, but I will. Um, but I have to tell you, you're not getting married in the church. You're getting married civilly. I must, you know, I can do this civilly. But I, I, I wish there was a, I, I wish there was a test case on this. I, I want this to go to court. I want this to be tested. Actually, I think that the religious minister should be 
um, decoupled from this civil jurisdiction, and then it might really free us a bit uh, about some of the ways we think about uh, marriage as religion and and that it's you know God's ordained thing. And in, actually, in the Catholic Church, there wasn't marriage until after the uh, authority until after. Um, the uh, Const you know, Constantine and 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 the kind of um, then a, a relationship between church and state, but you know the sacrament of marriage, it's not in the early church. Should we open it up to the audience? There's been a lot of skepticism about the Prophet case in California, both the tactics and the timing, and if it's the right thing to do, um, and more broadly about the corporate strategy in general. And I was wondering if you think that's just a gut feeling, that it's better to go you know, change minds in the church for the legislature uh, that confers you know, democratic legitimacy to a careful outcome and easier to defend the gains when they're made, or if you think there's actual empirical evidence that it's better to go that route. Uh, it's it's a great question, and of course, keep in mind that you're getting a response from a lawyer who has a certain bias about these things. Uh, but I actually think that when you look at a lot of social change movements, including the movement for LGBT rights, that 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 change comes from a multi-pronged, or as I think of it, a multi-dimensional strategy. So that there is advocacy in the courts, in the political arena. Uh, among the, you know, in, in faith-based institutions and at the dinner table, and that each of those has its role. Um, I think you're absolutely right what you said earlier, that, that, you know, changing the law, I think, is great on lots of issues, but it doesn't really stick very well unless there is the cultural change. And so one of, so the big question then comes, well, how do you figure out the timing, right? If we all agree about this in principle, how do you decide when is the right time to file a lawsuit? And that, you know, is hugely contested. When the ACLU filed its lawsuit seeking marriage rights in Hawaii in the 1990s, which it almost won, but the Hawaiians then amended their state constitution to make it a constitutional provision that marriage would only be between a man and a woman. Um, the other thing that got triggered by the Hawaiian litigation was ultimately the Defense of Marriage Act, which was signed by Bill Clinton in 1996. Right? So there was no marriage happening in the United States between same-sex couples uh, before then and really for seven years after that. But some would say, well, the Hawaiian litigation was a mistake right? because it prompted all of this backlash. I tend to think that, that social movements move in this way, right? They're, they move in fits and starts, mm -hmm. and that, you know, it is, um, this would be the really technical term, it is a drag when you get laws <laughs> that get passed be, that are, are backlash kinds of laws because it takes a lot of work to undo them. But just to, very briefly on the specific question of Proposition 8, so the short story there is that LGBT legal advocacy groups have been working really quite carefully for over a decade, uh, thinking about jurisdictions in which to file marriage litigation, which make good jurisdictions, which do not make good jurisdictions. There was a very deliberate decision to file in New Jersey a number of years ago for precisely the reason that there was good constitutional law and there were some other political pieces in place. Uh, when uh, Ted Olson and David Boyes decided to go to federal court to challenge Propositions 8, Proposition 8's repeal of marriage recognition for same-sex couples, there were many people among the GLBT legal advocacy groups who had concerns about that litigation for a couple of reasons. Um, one, because it was being led by people who weren't steeped in having thought about how to present these issues to courts over a lot of years, even though they're obviously both really uh, outstanding litigators. And two, uh, because of a timing question, there are sensitive politics in California whether about whether to go to court or not go to court. You know, was it the right decision? I'm not really going to actually say anything about what I think about that. Um, uh, what I will say, though, is I think lots of times, you know, you know, thing, you know, it takes movement to generate movement, and there's certainly been a lot of movement associated with that. I personally, what happened yesterday on that case, it's a complicated case. I will skip all the details for right now. But the Ninth Circuit, which is the Federal Court of Appeals, the stop before the U.S. Supreme Court, said in response to the Boys Olson challenge, 
we need the california supreme court to decide the question whether the supporters of proposition eight the people who are behind the initiative get to appeal their loss to through the court system why are they asking the question because the governor of california and the attorney general of california have not appealed their loss they believe proposition eight is unconstitutional they want the case to be over and the federal district court decision striking down proposition eight and recognizing marriage rights for same-sex couples to stand so the big legal question right now is if the state defendants don't want to challenge, don't want to continue, you know, want to give in, right? Say, okay, Proposition 8 is unconstitutional. Can the promoters of Proposition 8 continue to pursue the appeal? The, the, the legal point there is the promoters of Proposition 8 can't grant marriage, right? They can't take away marriage. They, they are not the state. And so there's a real, I, I, I don't actually think they have standing to appeal because I think they are not, they don't have the authority to, to give the remedy that the plaintiffs in the case the same-sex couples were seeking. The Ninth Circuit Federal Court said, California Supreme Court, you tell us whether a group that has promoted an initiative has some kind of a legal interest that gives them standing. And then you decide that question. So they've kicked the case over to the California Supreme Court, which will now hear argument not until September, so it's on a very slow track now. And then once they decide that case, they'll send their view back to the Federal Court of Appeals, which will then decide what to do with the California Supreme Court's view, and then make a decision from there. At that point, the challenges, the federal challenges to the Defense of Marriage Act, which are that different cases in Boston and elsewhere, will probably have their shot at the US Supreme Court. So those right now are likely to be the cases, if any, that go to the Supreme Court first. Yes. Yeah, I have a couple of questions um, seeking clarification. Um, when you were talking about relationships before, I understood that very well. And then it occurred to me that to ask the question of who determines a relationship. If I, did, if I choose a relationship with another person, be it anybody at any time, a man or a woman, that's a personal choice. And I don't see how that gets into the area of fundamental rights on the part of government. Because government doesn't care what relationship I choose. And I'm trying to relate that to your what you call a fundamental right. Right, so the, 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 the idea there is that over many, many decades, the US Supreme Court has recognized that people have, through the Constitution, through this due process right that I was describing, a fundamental right to marry. And so when the state places restrictions on this fundamental right, the state has to justify those restrictions. Uh, so for example, the state has lots of restrictions on who can marry, not lots, but it has some, right? It has age restrictions, it has uh, closeness in terms of blood relation restrictions. And so those can be challenged, those have been challenged, and, and most of, some of them have been sustained, some of them have been struck down by courts. But the argument that couples make is that the infringement is in, on, of the fundamental right. Likewise, with respect to the race-based rule. So when Virginia said people of different races can't marry each other, or white people and, and, and people of color can't marry each other, um, that was a race-based restriction, and the court says that interferes with your fundamental right to marry. When there was a restriction on people who hadn't who who, uh, who hadn't paid child support, yeah, sorry, men who were behind child support were, were forbidden in the 1970s from remarrying. Yeah, and, but people in prison were forbidden from remarrying, and in both of those cases, the court said, no, there's this special thing called the, fun, the fundamental right to marry. Now, what's interesting about it is the court treats this fundamental right as though it is the sort of natural law idea, this kind of pre-existing primal thing that we somehow have when really marriage is either is, is a for our for purposes here is a civil institution created by the state but that's that's the core idea there oh, sorry sort of to follow up with that though um like the place that the court established marriage is the right instigator of marriage right and so Being a right, just like what other reasons have been put forward for 
Well, I see Professor Hartog seems to want to answer that one, so let me let you uh, take answer. it up. I don't know if I want to. <laughs> I mean, the, part of the answer is that marriage, you know, we imagine immense continuity. But over a two, <laughs> three hundred year period, it's changed dramatically. I mean, it's, um, I mean, marriage was not understood as connected to individual happiness. Everybody mm -hmm. understands it as deeply intermeshed with individual <laughs> happiness today. It was about reproduction. It was about producing labor for the farm. You know, your children were your labor. You know, you had to produce them. What? Um, it was. Um, you know, why did you? Why? Why were there all these restrictions on adultery? Because you, to think from a very patriarchal perspective, you needed to mark your children as yours because they were your. They were assets. Um, and that's that's a world that. I assume very few of us identify with uh, today. Um, in, in the same way, there is a two-century struggle for equality within between men and women in marriage. Um, that's a struggle which um, I suppose the generation of people who are here mostly have have have, li have not lived through the struggle. But until the 1980s, in most states, there were all sorts of basic discriminations. Some of them were ostensibly in favor of wives. So by the 1980s, women won custody most of the time in most jurisdictions because they were naturally better mother. Uh, mothers were naturally better parents. <laughs> but there were all sorts of ways. A woman couldn't get a credit card. A woman couldn't have uh, have control of her own name. There, were, there, was a, there was a world of ways in which women were discriminated against in marriage, putting aside the sort of, are you covered over and do you have an identity? Even if you had a certain kind of identity, it was as subordinate within a household. Um, we've created a different structure of marriage for heterosexual couples. For That doesn't mean that Again, it's, it's like the civil religious distinction. What people do in their own homes is any number of things. But the state, the formal structures of the state assume a certain kind of equality for heterosexual couples. Um, but to exclude people from that is to exclude them from, from a variety of different things. And the third point is there are innumerable privileges built into the structure of marriage through the tax code, through Social Security, um, through you know the, the endless stories about gay couples who um, can't, who aren't recognized in hospitals as having authority to uh, make medical decisions for their partners. There's a world of ways in which it matters in a kind of direct and immediate way. So I'm avoiding the natural law question um, entirely, but just at a kind of concrete at a world of concrete levels. These, these play out all the time. I mean, I, I suppose everybody could give their own list of ways. In, in um, reading uh, Judge Walker's decision, uh, I thought it was very interesting because the, um, the uh, conservative side of religion entered for their testimony, um, uh, you know, and then they do this in the courts and they do this in the uh, political battle. Um, they, they say that marriage is for the procreation of children. Of maintenance of and the and the propagation of, for society, they never mention love. I remember going to the Senate hearings um, in a few years back on uh, the marriage amendment, and um, the ministers. There were actually no Catholics who testified, but the the Protestant ministers who were testifying. One of the senators actually said, uh, "Well, where is the relationship? Where's love in this?" And and the minister said, "Well, what's love got to do with this?" And it was a really telling remark that. Um, uh, the psychological dimensions of, of love, of, of marriage, relationship, uh, wants to be discounted be because they're trying to focus on the, the generative element of marriage as procreation with man and woman in a natural way. So if you, if you throw in the ideas of love and friendship and, and, and relationship, the, uh, it, it, it throws off their logic. Because then it allows for people who cannot have children, infertile, um, uh, aged, um, handicapped, um, 
uh, very sorts of uh, what in the Catholic Church would be reasons for um, annulments uh, with, you know, throw off the logic. So there, there's a deeply held naturalistic sense to marriage in that, in that way and that discounts the psychology that has come into the way most liberal Christians and Jews think about marriage today. I mean, it wasn't until the 1940s, actually, in the Catholic Church with an encyclical called Costi Canubi that actually brought in the psychological dimensions of marriage and, and saw that marriage was not only for procreation of children, but it was for the mutual fulfillment of the couple. And so many of the annulment cases today are based on that angle of the, the lack of fulfillment of the couple, that the person doesn't have the capacity to love and give the devotion and fidelity that goes into uh, a marriage. So this is a very interesting evolution, even in the Catholic Church regarding marriage. But I think that um, oftentimes uh, in the public debate, the, the, the liberal side, and I just know this from my friends and colleagues, they don't know these arguments, and so they just let this guy go. And rather than go and you know combat it, you know, this is at least one one aim I have as a as a Catholic activist in this. They say, no, this is not. That's your side of the Christian story. That's not the whole side of the Christian story. Well, I, I would just throw out uh, the statistic that I believe, and I think you remember this: is more than a million children in the United States who are being raised by same-sex couples. It's at least hundreds of thousands, but I believe it's more than a million now. So there's sometimes this conversation happens as if you know heterosexual couples have children and and same-sex couples don't. And in those more than a million households, um, the American Psychological Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, have said again and again and again that same-sex couples make perfectly good parents, um, at least as good a parents as everyone else. So it's a it's a conversation I think about family that we shouldn't back away from. Um, there's a reality out there. Um, that families are experiencing every day, and in fact, they're they're being challenged by the government in ways that they shouldn't be when they're trying to protect their families. Um, and the the reality of families just isn't matching up with the reality of government and, and law right now. I mean, the, actually, the one thing I would add is, it, it, for MPA students, if you're looking for really interesting research questions, <laughs> is why over a 40-year period, period, jurisdictions across America allowed gay adoptions while they resisted same-sex marriages. It's one of the really interesting legal, political, social, uh, and there's a social history to be written about the intersection of those two and why um, the walls fell very quickly on adoption by same-sex couples while, it, while the walls fell so much more slowly around same-sex Right, so now I have to say something, sure. which is just, and if you're looking to write the comparative paper, <laughs> um, one of the really interesting things is Europe, by contrast, was quick yeah, to move to right. adult relationship <laughs> recognition and quite slow and still contested in many countries with respect to parent-child relationships. So the whole, you know, here's your title, right? First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes, you know, baby in the baby carriage, question mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. So uh, my question is one of messaging, which I think dovetails really nicely with this conversation. Um, I think I share the view of a lot of people that it's really problematic to have the majority vote on the rights of minorities. Uh, but I also think that that's a, the reality of where this movement is going um, and is certainly part of the, the political piece. And so I guess um, I'm wondering what the lessons learned from California and Maine, where we really narrowly lost um, these campaigns are. And I, I think it has to do with messaging, which is, which is um, what I'd like the panel yeah. to Happy to take a first crack at it. So one thing that we did after the, the really devastating loss in Prop 8 and the really devastating loss in Maine was sort of step back and say, and, and pull together nearly 100 <laughs> data sets of polling and focus groups and messaging research that have been done. And far too often in all progressive movements, a lot of movements, we don't share enough. So we finally got everyone to share. And we sort of crunched all these numbers. And we said, what did, what did we learn? What did we figure out here? And the conclusions of that study really framed this new $10 million, uh, the biggest national public education campaign on marriage, which we're about to launch. So we're, we're trying to do this in a really thoughtful way. Um, what we found was that the equality and the rights-based argument, that marriage is equality, marriage, marriage equality is part of the LGBT rights movement, that got us that first 50% of, and it's, it was a very tepid 50%, obviously it wasn't enough of the actual voters who turned out in those states. 
um, explaining the equal protection and equal rights argument to people got us this first 50 percent of the, of the population. The question is then how do we move forward? How do we really solidify that both because of ballot initiatives and also just because it's important also to lawmakers and judges as well. Um, and what we found is that for that next set of the movable middle, there's sort of three thirds you can think about in the American population, a third that are strongly with us, a third in the middle that we're still in the conversation with and a lot already on our side, and a third that we're not going to get for a while, and we probably don't need to spend all of our time focusing on them. So with that middle third, we asked them in focus groups and in, and in polling, right after these battles, why do, why do heterosexual couples want to get married? And the answer that they gave us was love, commitment, family. And then we asked them, why do same-sex couples want to get married? And often the first answer was, I don't know. Or their answer was equal rights, protections, legal stuff. And then much lower love and commitment. So we saw that and we thought we really had seen an important problem for the next, for the next group of people that we want to win over. So the core, the core of our next messaging strategy which is not to set aside you know, equal rights and protection, particularly talking to our base that understands the thousands of rights that we've talked about a bit, but is to talk about why same-sex couples want to get married. The fact that there are couples who've been together for 30, 40 years, 50 years, um, who share in the same love, same commitment, the same families as everyone else. Um, and so we've put together this campaign and this messaging frame that seems to really help move those next people, uh, those next people over. Well, I just want to affirm that, and, uh, and it's particularly in the religious groups, um, framing then the theology of love and family has been uh, extremely important. I'm on a task force on Latinos in the U.S. with um, Protestant ministers and, and, and two Catholic priests, and uh, that's just the same thing, and I think we're all, you know, coming to terms. I mean, from a, I, th I think this is a problem of liberalism. We think people will do the right thing because it's right, legally right and civilly right. But, you know, the conservative side knows what the core values are better, and they know how to communicate them in terms of the deeper felt things. So the, they're better. It's, all, it's kind of counterintuitive. I mean, you think liberals with, you know, a sense of um, uh, fairness and solidarity and, and having a wider probably range of relationships would be more in, to, in tune with this. but. It's, it's, they're not. We're not. And, and so the conservative side it really knows how to get deep. I mean, you look at the whole eight years of George Bush and moving people around, um, you know, motive, emotional ways of doing things. Uh, George, George Lakoff, if you want to, you know, f find a guy, you know, who talks about this a lot, is George Lakoff, the cognitive psychologist at UC Berkeley. Did, uh, similar to the situation in California where the governor and attorney general did not uh, decide to appeal the Prop 8 uh, ruling, uh, there's a lot of talk that's been made about whether the president and the Justice Department has an obligation to appeal uh, the decisions about DOMA considering that the president has come out and said that he feels it's a discriminatory law. Do you think he has that obligation? And further, there are a lot of, of recent messaging that says that the Justice Department is kind of <clears throat> half-heartedly defending the suit um, for some other, you know, on some other agenda or some alternate purpose. What do you think about all that? <laughs> well, I think it's, you know, they're both interesting and contested questions. I think it, it is not entirely clear that the Obama administration has the obligation to appeal any decisions that go against the government. I think the political reality is that it does have to appeal those decisions, and that is often true. It was not the case in California where there was a clearer divide and, and, uh, and a state Supreme Court decision that said it violates our Constitution to deny same-sex couples the right to marry, so therefore the governor and the attorney general had some basis for saying, no, we're not actually going to appeal the loss in Prop 8, in the Prop 8 case, which takes that right away. I think that, the, to me, the real, one of the really interesting questions right now is then less do they have to appeal, but how do they handle themselves on appeal? And do they argue hard or do they argue lightly? Do they, do they make strenuous arguments to defend uh, the exclusion of same-sex couples from marriage or, or not so much? And I have to say uh, that so far the briefs have been a bit of a mixed bag. I wouldn't say that they've gone light. 
In fact, I would say that it has been surprising and the subject of a lot of, of anger on the part of some advocates that the government has fought Maybe not as maybe not with with sort of the most hostile anti-gay arguments that it might make, but has still fought strenuously to uh, preserve DOMA, just as it has fought fairly strenuously to preserve Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And I think, what does that have to do with? That's less about constitutional obligation and more about very political decisions, I think, inside the Justice Department. And if you're interested, there was actually a recent article sometime in the last week or two in the New York Times that gets, it's a little bit in the weeds legally, but it gets to the question of how will the government argue about what level of interest the government needs to have to justify the exclusion of same-sex couples. So just to go back to what I was saying earlier, right? Does, are, is the government going to argue, look, we just need the lowest level of anything goes as long as it's basically legitimate sort of interest? Or is the government going to try to argue or, or, or will the government concede that if it's going to exclude same-sex couples or differentiate between same and different sex couples, that it has to have some higher level, very, very good reason? I want to say one other quick word about the language question, why language matters, because it's such a difficult area in this sense. Right? On the one hand, the question about whether same-sex couples can be excluded from marriage is fundamentally, it's a legal question. Right? The government has drawn a line. Can it justify that line drawing consistent with the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution? Right? On the other hand, in terms of the public discussion, you know, you start to say Equal Protection Clause and people snooze. And it's not just this. When I was working on the measures in the middle of the 1990s that took away anti-discrimination protections from gay people. I remember being in a polling meeting about how we should message around that issue. And I said, well, you know, and they were talking about whatever. And I said, well, you know, what about the denial of equality and whatever else I said? And the polling person who's, who's a very prominent and really terrific polling person said, you know, that is an argument that is interesting to law students and lawyers. <laughs> um, that is not an argument that tends to move people. So you get into this interesting mix where, on the one hand, the arguments very much are legal. They are legal arguments about equality and about fairness, which is a step away from equality and a step away from the Constitution. But whatever, we'll claim fairness is a little bit legal. Um, and then when we think about marriage, really, I mean, we do think about love and commitment. But then when we look at the political realm and you see legislators talking about marriage and revising marriage laws, you, what you don't actually see conversation about procreation. What you see is this is a civil economic relationship. It sounds like a business partnership. So you, get, you have a lot of different conversations going on at the same time. And as a result, people are often actually talking past each other rather than joining issue and choosing from the pool of vocabulary that serves their particular interests without necessarily uh, uh, meeting, meeting in the middle. I don't think there's a simple answer. Um, I mean, you know, when um, when military discrimination was uh, repealed at the end of last year, polling was um, above 70 percent support consistently for that repeal. Um, sort of stepping aside from the question for a second, I'll, I'll try to answer it. Um, you know, there's there's this real lag time between public opinion and then lawmakers actually catching up and getting something done. We had had majority support for ending military discrimination for quite a number of years before before the job was finally completed. And now that we've hit that tipping point with marriage, we're, we're at 52%, um, I hope we'll be close to 60% soon. Um, I I'm assume there'll be some sort of lag, but our job is to make sure that there's as little lag as possible. Um, I, don't, I, don't think there's, I don't think there's a real answer. I think the conversation is a different conversation. I think we've seen the anti-gay forces certainly fought the military discrimination repeal, but I'm not sure, I, well, I think it's pretty safe to say they didn't put the same amount of money, the same, there haven't been the same number of state campaigns. It hasn't been um, as intensive a conversation. And I think, I think social conservatives and anti-gay groups have really chosen marriage uh, as a line in the sand and one that they're going to fight really hard on. Not to say they didn't fight very hard on military discrimination. It was a huge victory, but they're certainly fighting very hard on marriage. Can I have 30 seconds or are we out? Uh, 
no. <laughs> Sorry, it's the lawyer in me. I've got to get another word in. Um, which is just to say, I think another piece that explains a lot of this is dynamics around gender and gender norms and, and understandings of who men and women are. And people, when you talk about the military debate, the concern is about bathrooms and intimacy and showers. And when you think about marriage, the concern is about how do we have differences between men and women if sex differences is, are no longer policed through marriage by having a different sex requirement there. Well, this was an amazing talk, so please let me, uh, help me. Thank you. Uh, PJ has them on a very tight schedule, so we, <laughs> if you can um, resist going up and asking them a lot of questions, we need to get them to their next engagement. Oh my God. So okay. please uh, <laughs> keep your seats while we, while we leave. Thanks. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I know what I forgot.